This is Wickham Sound. Hello everyone, you're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM at Wickham Sound. I am your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly show where we talk about the local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we share some local and indie music, and we also head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story, and we check in with Twanglin' Jack Ford over in the Ilk Shed for a weekly album review as well. As always, you can find the Art Show on Facebook if you just search for the Art Show Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us, and you can email me here on the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk, that's D-A-N-E e.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk I particularly want to hear from people in the local creative pursuits who have got news to share. Any poets, musicians, performers who might have mp3s, writers, you're welcome to submit to the Rylight Zone as well and have a story or some poetry featured there. And basically if you're local, you're listening and you do cool artsy stuff, reach out to me. You can also listen to the show on Catch Up, so we're on iTunes and Spotify, as well as uh, Buzzsprout. And uh, yeah, if you just search for Wickham Art Show or The Art Show, you should be able to find us. So this week, we're chatting to Lasana Shabazz, who I caught up with recently over Zoom. And uh, Lasana has, uh, is like a, doing a residency at Wickham Library as part of like an I Am Wickham campaign. And um, they're actually looking for people to submit stories about themselves. We'll talk about it a little more in the interview later. But uh, also, it's their birthday today. So happy birthday, Lasana. I hope you have lots of awesome presents. Sorry, it's presumably your second birthday in lockdown now. No fun. But yes, uh, in the meantime, we are going to get to this week's episode of The Rylight Zone, and this is the fourth and final part of A Stone's Throw, written by myself, Dane Cobain, and narrated by Susie Q. DeMarco. So uh, next week, I think we're hopefully going to have Franz Alol on the show, and he's going to have a reading of his own. And uh, we've got a few other performers, actually, who will have some readings coming soon. And then hopefully Susie and I are going to be working on uh, a story called Amor for Phallus Titanium. Can't even say it. It's about the, the corpse plant. But in the meantime, this is part four of A Stone's Throw. The next witness to be called was little Cathy Barber, but her brother had already put the fear of God into her and instructed her about the lie she was to tell. By now, Cathy had figured out the truth, but she both loved and feared her brother and was willing to perjure herself to save his neck. When they asked who had given her the letter, she answered that a tall, distinguished gentleman had handed it to her from a cab window and asked her to deliver it with all haste. And there, with no further evidence available, the investigation stalled. Unfortunately for little Suki, justice was difficult in the shadow of the Chiltern Hills, and while efforts were made to track down Charles Dashwood, or whoever he was, they came to nothing. There was no report of him in the other inns, and nor had he appeared in London society. Stranger still, Molly Ford swore blind that she had been standing at the stables all night, plying her wares, so to speak, and that she had seen the man neither enter nor leave the Georgian dragon. Meanwhile, life in the village seemed to get back to normal, at least for the most part. For James Smith, however, life was anything but. The day after Suki's body was discovered, he came down with a fever which left him sweating despite the chill. Even with his bed placed close to the fire, the chill refused to die, and before another twenty-four hours had passed, it had taken over the rest of his body. It looked like he was losing the battle. There was no doctor in the village, and so one was brought in from Great Missenden. It didn't take him long to make his diagnosis. "'The boy has an infection,' the doctor said. "'A bad one. A malady of the blood.' Tell me, what caused this cut on the boy's neck? But no one in George's family could answer, and the two boys who had shared his secret weren't permitted to stand at his bedside. Jim's condition continued to deteriorate, even with all of the medicine that the doctor could give him, and the passage of a couple of days was enough to seal his fate. He died on a Tuesday, less than a week after little Suki passed, and he was buried on the Friday. His family couldn't afford to pay for the burial. But the undertaker agreed to do it for free. George Barber was the next to die. He had heard about what happened to Jim and thought that he could outrun death by stealing a horse and riding it at a full speed for the capital. Instead, he had been captured along the way, brought back to West Wickham and held before a judge. His family had hoped for leniency, especially because it was his first offence, 
but he was out of luck and ended up in front of old Justice Stonehouse. He was known by the unpleasant sobriquet of the Noose Judge, a nickname that he had earned through his unremitting habit of passing down the harshest of sentences. For George Barber, no exception was made. He was sentenced to be hanged from the neck until he was dead, and the sentence was carried out forthwith. His final words, which were only heard by the hangman as he pulled the lever to open the trap door, were, We killed her. Harry Baker, the writer of the letter and the architect of Little Suki's doom, lived a long and healthy life, but it was unclear whether he was even aware of it. The poor boy lost his mind and lived out the rest of his days in a sanatorium, where he was the subject of an endless stream of medical procedures that culminated in a botched lobotomy that silenced his hand and his tongue for good. He grew old there and was eventually buried beneath the oaks out back after no one claimed his body. Lord Francis passed too. Although he held on for another year as his health continued to deteriorate, little Suki's death seemed to have had a harsh effect on him, for he retreated to his manor and rarely ventured forth into the grounds. Stranger still, there were rumours in the village that an apparition, purported to be the ghost of Paul Whitehead, had been spotted wandering the grounds. Suki's father saw him several times, and it was said that the shock combined with the grief pushed him over the edge. He was found dead one morning in the stables with the horses that he so loved. He reeked of cheap spirits, but there was no sign of whatever had killed him. It was written off as an accident, but the gossips called it a suicide. His meagre assets were quickly claimed by the Crown and the Church refused to bury his body in sacred ground. Instead, he was buried without ceremony at a crossroads, so that if his spirit came back, it wouldn't know which direction to head in. With time, life in the village went back to normal, although stories started to spread of the ghost of a teenage bride in a white dress who could be seen in the darkness of the hellfire caves by those brave enough to venture there after midnight. There were few who met that criteria. Time passed, and the 18th century rolled into the 19th century, and then to the 20th. Little Suki was forgotten about, first because of the slow march of time, and later by the sheer number of young men from the village who gave their lives in the First and Second World Wars. Meanwhile, the country changed around them, and the horse-drawn carriages were replaced by motor vehicles, while television antennas sprung up on the sides of the rural houses. In the 1960s, an American called Jerry Pascal was visiting the area. Pascal had heard Suki's story from the lips of one of the perpetual old men who still drank themselves silly in the Georgian Dragon. The locals had said that he had braved the caves at midnight and returned to his hotel room disappointed, only to have a visitation that night. He woke to feel clammy, ice-cold hands on his forehead, and as he slowly rose to full consciousness, they passed along and reached his neck. He started to choke, and that was when movement came back to him and he was able to reach across to turn his bedside lamp on. The feeling of the hands disappeared along with the darkness, and he sat upright in his bed for a while, turning it all over in his head and trying to figure out what was real and what was nightmare. Eventually, he turned the light off and tried to settle back in again. He'd been lying there for a couple of minutes when he spotted something over by the door. It was a light, like the light from his lamp, but at a fraction of the size though it grew bigger as he watched it. It was opaque and pearly, hovering in the air like a will-o'-the-wisp. Again, Pascal turned the lamp on, and the light vanished only to reappear once more when the room was plunged into darkness. By now he was wide awake, and while he felt the fear of the devil at his heels, he picked up the courage to approach it. As he got closer, it grew brighter, until an eerie figure in white was illuminated. It looked like a teenage girl who was wearing an old-fashioned dress, something from the 1700s, perhaps. 
As soon as he reached the girl, he was overtaken by a wave of cold that left him breathless. His limbs were heavy, too heavy for him to hold them up, and he felt himself collapse to his knees. The light grew brighter, and he crawled backwards like a crab towards the safety of his bedside lamp. When he switched the lamp back on, the apparition was gone. Pascal kept the light on for the rest of the night, but he didn't go back to sleep again. He left early in the morning and vowed never to return. The room hasn't been slept in since, and even the staff at the Georgian Dragon don't like to go in there, especially at night. There are rumours of a ghost that haunts it, a ghost in a flowing white gown. That was part four of A Stone's Throw, written by myself, Dane Cobain, narrated by Susie Q. DeMarco. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, and it's time for a little bit of music. So we're going to play Fabulous Parfait. We've actually uh, spoken to them in the past for the show, so if you enjoy the tune, definitely do go uh, check out our archives and listen to that show, because uh, they had a lot of cool stuff to talk about. Your Fear by Fabulous Parfait. <laughs> my 
someone on your street, at your supermarket, or in your park is highly likely to have COVID-19. This is a national health emergency. Around one in three people have no symptoms and are spreading it without knowing. So it's critical we stay home. Don't meet anyone outside your household or support bubble, except for exercise. Only go out if it's essential. Stop the spread, stick to the rules. If you bend the rules, people will die. Stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. In the future, you'll be able to watch TV on your microwave. 3D print yourself a personal butler. You rang mom? And get fit by just looking at a treadmill. Okay, maybe not that. But wherever the technology does go, radio will go there too. Because Radio Player is working with the world's leading car and tech companies to keep radio out in front. Radio Player. In the car, in the home, in the future. Find out more at radioplayer.org. Deadlines to meet, targets to reach, clients to see. You're busy, and the last thing you need is to be thinking about your business IT. Take the headache out of it with CST. We offer the best possible technical support service and can tailor make solutions for your infrastructure, whatever your requirements. Outsourcing your IT is cost effective, and with CST, you'll have total support. For more information, visit cstlimited.com. CST, as IT should be. Screams and it falls. 
That was Radio Generation with their cover of Gene Genie, and before that we had Fabulous Parfait with Your Fear. Uh, me and my friend Dave, Twangling Jack Ford, who uh, will have his album review later on, we, uh, we're in a band called The Ilk and we sometimes play Gene Genie as well. Uh, I end up playing bass for it, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> anyway, we're going to hop over to our uh, interview for this week, and that is with Lasana Shabazz, who is a multimedia uh, performance an artist, actor, writer, you name it, um, and also currently artist in residence at uh, Books Libraries. First question, which is one I ask everyone, which is, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Oh, um, so there was basically, ooh, there's two. Um, the last, I read um, The Black Boy Pub by Michael McMillan, um, which is about Vincentian stories within High Wycombe, ironically. Mm -hmm. Um, but also I read a play called Yellow Man by Dale Linda Smith, where I reread it, um, which is about colorism within the South in America in the 1950s, I think it said. Cool. Um, yeah. And I, I just, I love the play, play wise. I love that work because it's very honest. It's very in your face. It doesn't try and hide anything. Yeah. And um, the book, The Black Boy Pub, it was really quite nice to reconnect to stories that I'd already heard it was quite nice to learn things I didn't learn um just about the area of High Wycombe and you know the the Windrush community and you know their experiences in High Wycombe basically which yeah. is effectively grandparents yeah yeah important stories there yeah and um and and so you mentioned you you read the play uh have you seen that play performed I've seen it yeah I was Gosh, I was 15 years old when I saw it. Wow. Mm. And I was just in awe. I was in awe of it. And I actually did it. Um, I did a monologue from it for my audition piece for drama school. Cool. Yeah, because that, I mean, that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today. Because so you've, uh, I mean, you've kind of had quite a varied career, really. So you trained as an actor uh, and you were an, well, you were an actor in residence in Amsterdam, I think, weren't you, for a while? I, I was I was an artist in residence. I think artist in residence. My, yeah, my my career has. I'm not surprised it, it's changed around given the experiences that I had as a kid. My dad's an artist, so I kind of I grew up in an environment which is very open minded. Yeah. And um, when I went to drama school, it just wasn't enough. I mm -hmm. wanted more. I wanted to make work. Um, and I love acting, but it just wasn't stimulating me enough. So when I did my residency in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. it just opened up a, a world of opportunities, basically. I was working with, you know, interdisciplinary artists like I am now. I was seeing the different ways in which they were working. There was a different approach to working. And the way that they worked, which is really inspired the work that I do, was all was all about connecting with the self and, you know, honesty and truth and transparency, basically. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, so you mentioned the the sort of the interdisciplinary art, which I suppose is sort of what, uh, you know, what you're sort of known for at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the stuff that you're working on at the moment? What, in terms of this project or just generally? In general, first, yeah. General. So um, my work kind of it incorporates different practices. So theatre, dance, visual art, um, construction. Um, I use makeup. I use costume. I design costume. I do different things within my practice, um, which is ever-changing, which is mm -hmm. quite exciting. Um, and it kind of, it can take the form of, a theatre piece um, surrounded by visual art with elements of dance, um, or it can take the form of a dance piece with visual art alone, 
Um, it very it varies on the project and what I'm doing. So what I did at Manchester Art Gallery was very much theatre um, with soundscapes that I created and edited myself. Um, and that was a, it was a live interactive performance that I did throughout the gallery yeah. um, with the audience, basically. Cool. And because uh, you mentioned the, the Manchester Art Gallery and a couple of other things, you've done residencies and commissions at the Tate Britain and the VNA as well. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about um, what those projects were and what they involved? Um, so the VNA, that was for, yeah, that was for a project they were doing around the Renaissance. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I choreographed and um, put together a performance around Renaissance dance, basically. Cool. And it was absolutely amazing to do. We did workshops with the public. Um, the performers that I had, um, we were all in big, massive Renaissance gowns with massive wigs. It was absolutely phenomenal. And the audience, we were working with like hundreds of people at a time which was really, really, um, it was it was a lot of fun and just very inspiring because the room that we were in was so grand as well and you could see yeah. how it was. Um, and the tape, that was a piece um, I in, initially I created um, for the tape, but I also did um, for a, a, an artist called Mickey Blanco. I opened for Mickey Blanco in Brighton. Um, and the piece was exploring um, microaggressions, basically. Yeah. And little things that you experience and how it kind of beats you down and how, you know, whether you let it beat you down, basically. Um, so, yeah, those are the two pieces at the Tate and the v &A. Cool. Awesome. And so now you're um, you're working on a project with uh, Books Library. So could you tell us a little bit about... Um... A little bit about that yeah so basically you know one thing about high Wycombe, which is really great and I, i've you know i've loved as a kid and i also love doing this project is that it's full of stories there's so many yeah. diverse stories the problem is is that you know who gets to decide what stories are valid to be told who gets to decide what stories are valid to be archived and that's why i want to do this project i want to give you know that diverse spectrum of the community in High Wycombe, that voice, the platform yeah. to have that voice, and also to have their stories archived. So I'm going to be doing interviews um, with people. So if people want to be interviewed, they can contact me um, mm -hmm. via um, the the website that I've created, or not the website, the email that I've created, which is buckslibrarystories at gmail.com. Um, I'm also going to be offering free online workshops exploring storytelling. Um, and the first one is starts next Thursday and they're going to be every Thursday for this month. And then I'm going to do more in April as well. Um, and they, people can get to those via Eventbrite. So they just have to look for mm -hmm. I am Wickham um, free storytelling workshops. And also I, I'm giving people the opportunity to submit their own stories. So if people decide, actually, I want to write a story and I want to write something, especially, you know, at this moment with COVID and people being locked up, is I want to do something creative. Yeah. Um, there's also the opportunity to submit a story. So you can submit um, a story about a fairy tale or folklore from your childhood, um, the story of how you got to Wickham, um, or the story of where you live in High Wycombe and you can submit one of each or all three. It's completely up yep. to you. It's the same email for submission. So it's buckslibrarystories at gmail.com. Um, High Wycombe Library have also set up a drop box outside of the library. So if people don't have access to email and they want to write a story freehand and then give it in, that's an opportunity for them to do that. Um, that, that's, that being the site in the Eden Centre. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm on top of that, I'm going to be making work in response to all of my connections with the community. Um, but then also the history that I find, because, you know, High Wycombe is effectively part of my own family history as well. Yeah. So it's going to be quite a diverse um, 
spectrum of work. I, I can envision it being a season of, of online work, basically. And I'm hoping to get some of the library staff involved as well, which will be exciting. Um, yeah, and I'm, and I'm working with some, I've connected with some really great people. Um, I've connected with some schools, which is great. I've connected with, um, who else have I connected with? Sign Dance, which has yeah. been absolutely, they've been brilliant. Um, Wickham, Youth Action, like so many different spaces, which are really excited, which, you know, is making me excited as well. I yeah. mean, this is one thing about the, you know, Wickham, it's been really lovely to come into this project, especially at this time with what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Welcomed with open arms, you know, and it's it's it makes creating art just... It's like, I feel like I'm in, an, I'm in a womb. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> Good. Awesome. And um, so you mentioned your own personal history with the town. Could you sort of tell us a little bit about that um, and sort of some of your childhood memories? Yeah, well, my grandparents met at High Wycom Station mm -hmm. and they got married in High Wycombe. So, you know, I, I found some of their records in the library, which is exciting. My dad was born in High Wycom. He grew up in Desperate Road. Yeah. Um, before moving to London when he was 13, 14. Um, and I remember going back to High Wycombe as a child. And my dad being an artist, he would take me around the UK all the time. And it was the one place I didn't feel disconnected to. Mm -hmm. It was part of my family history. And, you know, my dad would point out places and he would point out where he went to school. Um and for me, that, you know, that mode of storytelling has been essential in, in my childhood. My granddad would sit me down before bed with a cup of tea and my toast and tell me stories. And that kind of added to that history of storytelling, which is, in, in, you know, in turn inspired this project. Yeah, um, yeah. Because I can't think about High Wycombe without thinking about stories and thinking about my grandfather. And, and are you going to kind of go full circle and make sure that, you know, your grandfather's stories are a part of the exhibition? Oh, of course. Of course. I have to. I have to. Because he is the main inspiration. Um, and I'm excited to, like, I, I'm excited to, you know, when things open up, I want to visit the Bird in the Hand pub, mm -hmm. which, you know, my, my cousin owned. Um, at the time, I want to I want to go to those places. So I, yeah, I'm very very excited. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I guess one of the things, obviously, putting this on during a time of of a pandemic, um, how like challenging has it been to do that? Because presumably, normally you would have done you know in person workshops, and you know you would have been able to do a lot more face to face stuff. Well, that was the plan initially to kind of mm. if it to be more personal. Um, it has been challenging, but I think for me, the approach I take to every project is every project has its challenges. And I think yeah. it's it hasn't been crippling. It's just been about adapting. And I think you have to be able to adapt, especially in projects like this, full stop, even if it wasn't a pandemic. Yeah. Um, but it's been, I'm at a place now after the stress and after, you know, tier five, tier six, tier seven, tier eight, tier nine, tier 10, I'm at a place now where I can really enjoy it. And I'm really yeah. enjoying it because I, I feel very comfortable in what I'm doing. I don't feel that it's going to be disrupted by COVID. It's COVID secure. Yeah. Um, and I'm able to really enjoy it now, which is, which is great. Awesome. And I mean, I think as well, people in general have got more used to stuff going online because we're this far into the pandemic, you know. Uh, so I wondered what what has the response uh, from people been like so far to it? Um, there is I think this is this is the thing. I think the whole online platform, it's for me, even myself, I found it quite daunting. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't I was out to do some online um, performances and work um, last year. I just, I didn't feel comfortable. So I, I understand um, people's hesitance with it. Although having kind of got into it, it's absolutely amazing. And mm. just the ability to connect in the comfort of your own home, where yeah. you feel comfortable, where you feel safe, 
it just enables, and I think creatively, it's going to enable so much more um, great work, which is really exciting. Um, and the response so far has, as I said, everyone's been very warm, very exciting. Um, I'm looking forward to the first workshop next week. Mm. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Lasana Shabazz. And it's time for a little bit more music. So this is Lewis Branch with Blah. I'm so over everything Love songs dancing in the rain I'm so over feeling tired I've been running around chasing all your lies blah, blah, And now I'm bored of hearing you talk Bored of hearing your thoughts Bored of hearing what's on your mind So can you just shush? Bored of hearing you talk Bored of hearing your thoughts Because every time you move your lips All I hear with Blah. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm joined in conversation by this week's guest, who is Lasana Shabazz. And um, so what was the submission process like? Um, you know, how how much work did you have to put into it? And, um, you know, did you sort of chat through with uh, the books library teams and stuff? Did you have to pitch to them? It was a big presentation, which I was very nervous about. <laughs> um, but I think for me, the main thing that drove me through it was just transparency, honesty, yeah. and effectively, you know, what I wanted to do was celebrate the diversity and the spectrum of the diversity in Wickham. Yeah. Um, because I just growing up in inner city London myself, I've seen what can happen when, you know, diversity is celebrated, not tolerated. And I feel that in so many other places around the UK, it's tolerated. Um, it's not given a voice. And the one thing I was saying in another interview that I, I love about, you know, this country is there's no such thing as pure British. 
British mm-hmm. is made up of so many different aspects and so many different cultures. It is so diverse anyway, and the history is so diverse. But it saddens me that that is not always truthfully celebrated. There's not, you know, there's an element of secrets. Um, and I want to celebrate that because yeah. we all not have the country we have if it wasn't for that diversity. Um, and, you know, there are community groups in Wickham who've been forgotten. And I don't want that to continue. I want to kind of give them a platform. I'm, you know, I think one thing that I, I said to the library staff and everyone I've been working with is if I can start the process of building that relationship and connection with people who have been forgotten. So there's groundwork, there's development in that relationship past this project. My job is done. Yeah, that's it. You're sort of almost, you know, starting the conversation and hoping that people will continue it. Um, But also it's it's really interesting because, I mean, one of the because I wasn't born in Wickham, I was born in um, in the Midlands, nearish nearish Birmingham, uh, and so the town that I came from, according to Wikipedia, is ninety nine point five percent white, whereas um, Wickham is I think it's like sixty eight percent or something, and it's actually mm-hmm. Wickham's more diverse than the national average by quite a bit. And for me, that's what one of the things I love about the town. And I think um, especially creatively, there's just such like a wide melting pot of influences. And yeah. so uh, it's, it's nice that there again, you're running a project like this to try and just to try and get that dialogue dialogue going. Definitely. I think it's very, very important. I think it's important for the next generation, um, yeah. especially um, at a time with a pandemic, especially at a time where. You know, there are so many fractures in so many different ways. It's important to celebrate the positives. Um, and as I said, you know, celebrate rather than tolerate, which I yeah. think is, is kind of, <laughs> it's not done as often. Yeah. And it's it's not like an extreme statement or anything like that as well. You know, I think most reasonable people would agree with that. So. <laughs> But yeah, it's just pushing that. Cool. And um, I mean, one of the questions I wanted to ask, and I, I don't know whether it's as necessarily as true for this as maybe some of your others, but, um, you know, some of your work, I think, can be quite challenging, either in, um, you know, the, you know, the formats that you're actually presenting it in or the questions that it's asking. Um, how important is it to you to to sort of challenge people with your work? Oh, it's it's very important. It's, it's key. I think as an audience, I love to be challenged because that's mm-hmm. what I, I think and that's when I really enjoy and I um, engage with a piece of art, you know, in any form. For example, Michaela Cole's I May Destroy You. It was challenging because it made you look at your own experience. Mm-hmm. Um, it made you look at yourself. And I think... For me, that's what art is. You know, as an artist, you can't make art without yourself because your identity is key to the art that you make. Mm. Even if you're an actor, you know, because you need to be able to understand and own yourself to play another character. But to connect with an audience in that way and make them look at themselves at the same time, so you're Mm. both looking in the mirror together, you're sharing that experience, it's key. Yeah. Um, that challenge can be can take any form. It can take the form of making someone angry, or making someone laugh, or making someone cry, or or making someone just as simple as being reflective. Yeah, yeah. And uh, talking about identity, so I, I saw a quote where you were described as a, a black British queer artist from Caribbean migrant descent. Uh, mm-hmm. How much how much does that play into your work? I mean, I suppose with any artist you put a lot of yourself into your work don't you so (laughs) it's it's I think it's I think it's key identity is is absolutely key it's for me growing up being black and being British I'm able to see a spectrum that people who aren't black and British can't Mm. you know and being queer on top of that adds another spectrum just like um a woman um, can see a spectrum that I can't see. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, that's, that's life. Yeah. Um, so I think for me, that open spectrum that I see, my identity, which, you know, in, goes into my work and is deep rooted within my work, 
um, it's very important. It's very important because I think if I wasn't able to be honest with who I was and own who I was unapologetically, I wouldn't make the work that I make. It yeah. would be very wooden. Um, and the thing is, you can tell when you're watching a piece of art when someone is not connected with themselves yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah, 100% agree, yeah. <laughs> and, and also, I mean, I suppose that it feeds back nicely into what you're doing with the projects at the Wickham Libraries where, you know, again, that's all about sharing people's stories and I suppose celebrate celebrating identity both as individuals but also as part of, you know, the identity of the communities they fit within as well, you know, and the town's identity as a whole too. So it's it all comes together really nicely, I think. Definitely, definitely. Um which is really exciting. Um, I mean, I'm really, one, one of the things that I want to, I'm doing in this project as well is exploring different types of storytelling. So yeah. I have some people who I may be working with in their mother tongue mm -hmm. um, and not English, because I think one of the things I learned in, in Holland when I was there doing my residency is that you don't need to be speaking the same language to understand the story. Yeah. There's different variants in storytelling. And I really want to explore those nuances. And also um, sign language, you yeah. know, as well as different vocal languages. I think there's so many different ways to tell stories. And I think I want to challenge people to connect in ways that is not... Um, it's not pedestrian. They able. They have to connect with another human being, and I think that's what I really want to do mm. in this project. Is that well, it, and, and you mentioned uh, sign language, which I was thinking of that as you were talking, and particularly like sign dance because mm -hmm. it's such a such a, a human thing, and it's not in. Um, obviously, it doesn't use any language, um, but it's all in the body language and the way people move. And um, I think like dance is like music, where it's universal, you know, and you don't have to speak the same language to you know both appreciate something so mm -hmm. and uh, also like obviously visual stuff so you can tell a story by drawing you know you don't don't necessarily have to use words and I think that's uh, really interesting like these different ways and and then also I think that kind of opens it up to people a bit as well because it allows them to use whatever they feel the most comfortable with so as you say if English isn't their first language then they're going to feel less comfortable trying to tell a story in that than if they're using something they're more familiar with. Exactly. And I, I want to remove as many barriers as possible. Mm. I mean, also the, the free um, storytelling workshops are going to take the same format. Yep. It, it's not about making people embarrassed or making people perform. It's, it's giving them the opportunity to explore the arts in a safe environment, um, to explore creating. Um, and if they feel comfortable, ex explore sharing. Because yeah. I think there's something about making a piece of art, whether that be writing or creating a character and sharing that, which is terrifying, but also the feeling that you get when you do that. And mm. it's, I mean, I remember the first time I did it when I was, I don't know, five. It's, it's phenomenal. And the difference in how that affects you. I mean, you don't have to go on to become an, you know, a writer or an artist, but the difference in terms of, you know, individual self-esteem and their confidence is just, it's, it's inspiring to see. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So um, just a couple more questions just to end on. So the first one would be, um, what have you got planned um, next? I mean, obviously with this project, you're mostly going to be fo focusing on your workshops. Um, so I guess what does the end of this project look like for you and what do you hope to do after that? Um, the end of this project for me is handing, well, it's, it, for me, it's not the end for me. Well, it's the end for me, but it's not the end for, for Wickham. It's handing over the baton to, to other people to continue. Mm -hmm. So I, I want, I really want to have... Um, a cohort of people who I've connected with in this project who are going to take over the, the process of working with stories in the library yeah. um, from different backgrounds who are going to work on making sure that there's more diverse resources within the library. It's about, for me, starting those conversations, yeah. which is absolutely key. And for me, I think it's this project has been quite 
Um, so far, it's been very exciting, but also very reflective. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be about, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? I don't know. I don't know. I think I like to keep an open mind, which is exciting. Yeah, yeah. It's an yeah we'll come We'll come back and check with you in a year's time. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And uh, where can people follow you to find out more? And uh, while you're at it, if you want to give another shout out to how people can submit as well. So I'll go over the submissions first. So if you want to be interviewed um, by myself, um, those interviews can be video or they can be just audio. Um, you can email me at buckslibrarystories at gmail.com. Um, also, if you want to submit a story, either um, about a fairy tale or folklore from your childhood, um, the story of how you got to High Wycombe, or the story of where you live in High Wycombe, or all three, you can submit that to the same email address, which is buckslibrarystories at gmail. And sign up for a free workshop, um, which is every Thursday from next Thursday from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Um, All you need to do is go to the Eventbrite page, and Bright is spelled Mm B-R-I-T-E, and search for I Am Wickham free online storytelling workshops. And that's it. And, and where can people me, follow you? Um, more, I would say just Google Lasan Le Shabazz. Well, I'm on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also on Facebook, but there's only one me. <laughs> um, so look for Lasan Le Shabazz. And, and that's, that's L A S A N A S H A B A Z Z C. Thank you very much to Lasana Shabazz for joining us. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM at Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. It's music time, and this is a Dreamlike State by Joe Martin. Thanks very much to Joe for sending this in. I'm here, I'm here, like a light in the sand. On dry land. Maybe I should be writing something to mean something to somebody. To me, but the words are like drip, drip, and somehow they don't want to fit, fit. There's a shift and the changes. I'm into different stages. Oh, I'm just so here reflecting on my life. Taking step by step but Sometimes I'm not walking Or talking Lying on the carpet in a dreamlike state Lying on the carpet in a dreamlike state I'm just sad here Reflecting my life, taking step by step. But sometimes I'm not even walking or talking. Lying on the carpet, dreamlike state. Love WhatsApp, love Wickham Sound. Use WhatsApp to message us. Just send your message to 01494 449900. Go on, give it a try. Someone on your bus, on your train, or waiting at the platform is highly likely to have COVID 19. This is a national health emergency. Around one in three people have no symptoms and are spreading it without knowing. 
so you should only travel if it's essential. Always cover your nose and mouth, keep a safe distance from others, and wash your hands the moment you arrive. Stop the spread, stick to the rules. If you bend the rules, people will die. Stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. That was our dreamlike state by Joe Martin. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to head over to Twangling Jack Ford in the Ilk Shed, who is going to share this week's album review. Ram, the only album credited to Paul and Linda McCartney. This was the first album he released after the split of the Beatles. And it was his second album. And rather like the first one, it's very underproduced. It's almost like home demos. And I've seen it described as the first indie album, which is why I basically revisited it. And it's got some very good songs on it. It's got the famous Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey, and it's got the song Too Many People, which was taken by John Lennon as a swipe against him. And it probably was, and it was one of the things that started the feud where Lennon then wrote How Do You Sleep in return. Uh, but this is a very good album. It's got some good songs on it. And if you're not looking for big production, this is a very good listen. Ram, Paul McCartney. Thank you very much to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to everyone whose music I shared. And a big thank you to Lasana Shabazz for joining me as well. I've been your host, Dane Cobain. We'll be back next week at 7pm on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. If you missed the show, you can always find us on iTunes and Spotify, various catch-up services. And do feel free to join us by liking the page on uh, Facebook. Well, just search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound on Facebook. I'm going to leave you with one more song until next week. And so this is Straight 8 with Grit Saint Groceries. I'll see you next week. If I don't love you, baby Grits and groceries, eggs and poultry And ponies are one of man Oh yeah! Listen! All around the world, I'd rather be a fly Allow my baby step for a moment till I die with a toothpick in my hand, I dig a temper ditch And run off in the jungle, fight a line with a switch Cause you know I love you, baby You know I love you, baby If I don't love you, baby, you say We'll say groceries, eggs and poultry A Mona Lisa was a man Is on my feet. I'm trying to find my baby and bring her home with me. You better run into me, baby, and I'll be convinced. You don't run into me right now, woman. You ain't got no sense. Cause you know I love you, baby. You know I love you, baby. If I don't love you, baby, you say, Prince and Rose,
This is Wickham Sound 89.4. 